text today, verses 19 through 26. This text is a continuation of what we looked at last week, and yet it can stand on its own as a very uh, applicable text to our lives today. I want to read God's word and then ask for his, his help. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also tell you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Father, May this holy, inspired word, which we have read today, plant deep roots into our hearts and into our minds. May we hear to obey, listen to understand. We ask that you would drive away from us a contentious spirit, That is, a spirit that would contend with your words. And instead, our we might be receptive to what you have said. Holy Father, Spirit of God, I pray that today I would be simply a tool of the life-giving, soul-changing word that is eternal. And that through your word, you would give life to your people so that Jesus Christ, you are praised in us and through us. In your name I pray these things. Amen. Christian, your daily battle against your flesh, your fight against sinfulness, is not a fair fight. There's an underdog in the fight. One who will lose the battle. But it is not you. It is your flesh. It is sin that will ultimately lose the battle for your soul. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, He grabbed a hold of your sin its nature and authority over you. He grabbed a hold of your sin. He wrapped it around himself. And as he was nailed to the cross, he would not let go of your sin. And in Christ, your sin nature died. It's dead. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And what he says in Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. 
that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. And again in the letter to the Corinthians, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Beloved of God, in your justification, you are freed from the penalty of sin. In your glorification, you will be freed from the presence of sin. And in your sanctification now, you are freed and are being freed from the power of sin. Yet we know, we experience that same struggle with the remnants of our crucified old man with its passions and desires. Paul often personifies these sinful passions and lusts that we war with inside. And he gives it a few names. It's called the body of sin in Romans 6. That's that warring passion, the body of sin. In in Ephesians, he says the deeds of the old man. This is his way of describing it. In Romans 7, it's the wretched man that attacks him. And here in Galatians, it's this word flesh. All the same description of the same thing. Those passions and desires, those sinful desires that war within you, pulling you from God's truth to sinful fulfillments. It's this flesh that Paul warns about in our text when he says that that to not allow our freedom to become a means to give an opportunity to the flesh. Don't give that enemy a moment. Don't give him anything to help him. And what he means when he says, then walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This flesh is ravenous. It seeks to destroy us. It's hellish and demonic. And it's with all of us. In Romans, Paul tells us that the old man, that's the old nature, the sinful depravity that we had by birth or by conception really, is dead in Christ. But the flesh or the body of sin remains as a continual principle of sinful passions and lust, demanding that we yield ourselves to it. But he says, reckon yourselves therefore dead indeed to sin and alive to God. Yield your members as instruments of righteousness, not yielding yourselves as instruments to the flesh, to unrighteousness. And this companion text of Romans and Galatians, they go together. Paul is telling the Christians here in Galatians that we are freed from the yoke of the law and we are freed from the yoke of sin and the Holy Spirit has been given to us in our conversion, something I can't explain, but something that is true. The Holy Spirit has been given to us in our conversion to Christ and the Holy Spirit wars against that flesh, which is what makes it such an unfair fight. It's God versus flesh. God always wins. Ultimately, in the end, we see his victory. Thus, we ought to walk in the spirit of God, he says, freed to love God and others rather than to love ourselves and our flesh and its desires. In the New Testament, especially in Pauline literature, indicatives inform and motivate imperatives. What do I mean by that? Um, indicatives, that's, that's simply a way of saying factual statements, things that are true. Things that are true, factual statements, truthful realities, these motivate imperatives or commands. It's, it's actually quite different from most religion or religion out there because in religion, in, in the religions of our world all around us, it's the idea that imperatives create indicatives. Do this so that you can be But in the gospel, it's you are so that you can do. The indicative, what you are, motivates what you should do or be and act and live. And that's very common in the New Testament. It's very common, especially in Pauline literature. The greatest example of this has got to be the book of Ephesians. For half of the entire book of Ephesians, Paul the apostle doesn't give one command to the church. 
For the first three chapters, he doesn't say do this anywhere. He just essentially gives a barrage of indicative statements. You are, you have, you are blessed, you have this blessing, you have this grace, you have this reality. And he just lists this barrage of of these things of adoption and indwelling of the spirit and redemption and church family. And he says, this is what you have. And then he says, this is your calling. This is what God has given you in calling you. And then in chapter four of Ephesians, he breaks from those indicatives and gives almost nothing but imperatives for the rest of the book. And he says this to kind of encapsulate. He says, therefore, walk worthy of the calling with which you have in Christ Jesus. He says, this is the indicatives. This is what is true of you. So walk in a way that is consistent with truth. Walk as you are, not walk to be. And that's the difference between Christian, biblical Christianity and every other religion. Walk as you are, not walk so that you can be. It's interesting that in this passage in Galatians, you can outline this text along the lines of indicatives and imperative. And consistently, the large section of this text is indicatives. And it's, it's, it's important that we understand this. Uh, why is this so important? Because we generally read too quickly in God's word and we turn indicatives into imperatives. And that's not good. We shouldn't do that. Uh, notice with me in this text, 19 down all the way through verse 24, these are all indicatives. There is no commands in 19 through 24, no imperatives, all statements. And then in 25 and 26, he finally gives the commands, the imperatives. In fact, it's just one imperative, well, two, but they're related. One produces the next. So one main imperative following really three indicatives in this text. Um, And and when I say we often make a mistake by skimming and reading too fast and then we turn indicatives into imperatives. For example, we get to the fruit passage where it says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace. And we say, okay, so what this God is telling us here is be loving, be joyful, be peaceful. But that's not actually, and where that's, that's true, and there are places in the Bible where it says to be loving. I'm not denying that. But that's not actually what the text is saying, right? It's actually saying, it's actually a statement. The fruit is love. He's just saying this is true. Same thing when you get to verse 24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh. And he's saying, people will preach this. So this means you need to crucify your flesh. And, and that may be true as far as it goes. I think there's an implication of that. But what's he saying there actually? If you look at the words carefully, he's saying you have crucified your flesh. It's a statement, not a command. And we can see the difference because when he gets to 25, now that changes. He says, so now let us, which is an imperative, so now walk. So these indicatives in 19 through 24 will inform and motivate the imperative of verses 25 and 26. That's the outline for the sermon today, and that's the way we're going to look at it. You could put it this way. Let the blessedness of who Christ is and what he has done and is doing in and through you motivate and empower you to walk in the spirit. Do or walk because you are. All right, let's back up and see these three theological indicatives first this morning. Uh, The first two of these three indicatives, the first two theological statements the Apostle Paul makes are a sort of good news, bad news, or really bad news, good news idea. It's the reality of the works of the flesh, bad news, and the reality of the fruit of the Spirit, good news. Two opposing principles. He's already said back in verse 17 that flesh and spirit are at war fighting against one another. So these are two opposing ideas. He's continuing this on. The works of the flesh, he says, these are plainly evident. And the fruit of the spirit, he says, these are without controversy or there is no law that can, that can violate these. In other words, there's nothing that anybody could say this is bad. 
You can't say love is bad. Joy is bad. Peace is bad. So he's saying, so very evident works of the flesh and incontrovertible fruit of the Spirit. This is the kind of the column idea he's putting here as he gives these two um, principles to begin with. Now, the commands have already been given. There have been some imperatives already given. I mentioned them earlier. He says, don't provide opportunity before the flesh and don't fulfill the flesh. But that has been the same imperative. He's going to repeat in verse 25, walk in the spirit. So he's going to keep repeating that idea. It's a simple imperative. But if we are going to walk in the spirit, that is, if we are going to not provide opportunity for the flesh, if we are going to not fulfill the lust of the flesh in order to glorify God, then we really ought to know who and what our spiritual enemy looks like. We really ought to have a clear understanding of the flesh. Not only its operations, not only its deceptiveness, but we need to have a clear understanding exactly what it looks like. And I can tell you, as we know, but Paul here is saying it's evident, we all know this, it's not pretty. It's not attractive. It's not a very good look. The reality is, we must understand that there are enemies in this world that hate the child of God. The world hates God's people. I mean world, I mean the, the philosophies, ideology of the world and the people who propagate them, not every person. The devil hates God's people. Your flesh hates you. And Paul may talk about the devil in some places. And the Bible may talk about the world in other places. But Paul is zeroing in on an enemy to your sanctification, an enemy to God's holiness, an enemy to the righteousness and the glory of God that walks and breathes and lives and sleeps with you. Sleeps with me. It wakes up with me. And it goes with me. And he's describing this enemy of the flesh as recognizing that our great enemy is an internal one. We live in a culture today, a society today that wants to suggest that all the problems that I face, every issue that I have, it's because of something or someone out there. The government, my boss, my spouse, my kids, my neighbors. That's where the problems lie. But Paul is telling us, and Christian, we need to understand this. He is saying, your flesh produces these sorts of works. Enemy from within is a dangerous enemy. As James informs us, we are tempted when we are drawn away of what? Our own lusts and enticed. The simple reality is this. Our flesh and flames, bursts into flames, godless vice. Our flesh inflames godless vice. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. This is what the godless world looks like. This is what our fleshly culture embraces. This is what a person given over to the flesh works out in his relationships. This is what a professing Christian looks like who is not walking in step with the Spirit but is fulfilling the lust of the flesh. These are the godly fl- vice, godless vices that our flesh pursues. Now there is a minor textual variant in the Greek. Some translations thus have the word adultery as the first one and some do not. But if you include the word adultery, there are 17 plain fleshly works listed by the apostle. Lest we think if I get a hold of these 17, take care of those, I'm all good. No matter, no have to worry about the works of the flesh. Paul ends it all with saying, and the such like. Or, and any others like this. So this isn't an exhaustive list, even at its 17. And yet Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, thought it was a good thing to keep listing, almost in a tedious fashion, all 17. It's important for us to understand what the flesh looks like. I don't think it would be good for our short time here today for me to walk through and agonize over the Greek word of each one of these and all the different ways it could be glossed and understood. I think a couple of good translations just kind of putting them side by side and reading, I think you have a good understanding of the works of the flesh. They're evident. But I do want us to think about maybe some bigger principal pictures when you look at this list to think through it. 
The first thing I notice when I look at this list is just how the works of the flesh are selfishly motivated. Look at your list in front of you. Notice how much selfishness is represented in this list. From sexual selfishness to plain arrogant and conceited contentions, outbursts of rage, envy, jealousy, wrath, hatred, dissension. You see the selfishness behind the works of the flesh? I also notice how creative the flesh is. Follow with me a little bit, especially in this, the sexual sort of fleshly pursuits that he mentions. It's interesting to me as well that a lot of these are sexually, sexually geared. Uh, sexuality is not by any means sinful. Uh, but it is interesting, it is without controversy that, that the flesh seeks as one of its chief um, gifts of God to manipulate and pervert, it is sexuality. Um, money, sexuality, and fame. Those three vices uh, seem to be one of the chief attacks of the flesh. But just notice, in this, especially in these sexual descriptions here, the variety. <laughs> he says uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, that's, that speaks of sexual impurity, lewdness, that's, that is the idea of a, of, a, of a sexual perversion. More of a, actually a look, one's perverted look. Um, goes on uh, down further, and he, at the bottom, and he talks about revelries. That, that's actually the word for orgies. Uh, why didn't he just say, you know, sexual sins? Why did he list one of the reasons, and you see it again in another example. You see it here with the, with the rage. He describes the same thing. Hatred, strife, dissension, outbursts of anger. Outbursts of wrath. What's hatred or outbursts of anger? Aren't they the same thing? He's describing it. It's, it's creative. And isn't that true experientially, my friend? You think that you have one area of the flesh pretty well under control. And somehow your flesh is creative enough to find another way to get in there. Uh, adultery, oh, I'm not going to be adulterous, but, but sexual morality, well, I won't be sexually immoral, but, but pornography, but, but I won't find a way to constantly find some way to attack. Successfully creative. One of the other aspects of these works of the flesh that intrigue me is they're relationally destructive. Most of the works of the flesh mentioned here, one could make an argument all of them, have to do with community involvement. In other words, there's someone else involved the anger, dissensions, outbursts of wrath, envy, jealousy, uh, sexual morality. This is all destructive, and this is the reality. The flesh not only seeks to destroy you, the flesh seeks to destroy everyone around you. In the community, the flesh does not foster fellowship. It hates unity among God's people. It seeks to create division and dissension and wrath relationally destructive. One of the interesting uh, words there is the word uh, uh, heresies. Literally, that's the idea of campaigning there. (laughs) People who who are campaigning for their cause. Selfish, creative, destructive. Jump down to verse 24. This isn't in the list, but he describes the flesh again in verse 24 with two other words. He says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Interesting, he describes the, the flesh and he says, now the flesh is crucified in the believer with its, or this is the main feature of the flesh. Passions and desires, passions and lusts. Now that's interesting because that's referring to somewhat of our feelings. And is it interesting that the flesh is often feelings-based The flesh is especially powerful because it primarily works with our feeling rather than our knowing. You see, feelings are dangerous. Not because they're always wrong. Feelings can be right. Right or wrong, feelings are always persuasive. That's what feelings, they're, they're persuasive. We are persuaded by our feelings. Now you know this to be true. I know this to be true. All the facts in the world 
don't motivate me to act. Generally, it is something that appeals to my feelings and my emotive sense that motivates me to act. Feelings are persuasive, and so the flesh knows that, and so the flesh will cause us to emphasize how we feel over what we know. Finally, I notice in this list that the works of the flesh are eternally damning. Eternally damning. After Paul lists the works of the flesh, which plainly are opposed to the fruit of the Spirit, the the goodness and righteousness, he says this, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The law will not get anyone into heaven, but sin will surely keep people out. You see, this plain truth must not be missed. People go to hell because of the flesh, because of sin. Sin is what separates us from God. The Bible says the soul that sins, it shall die. Jesus died to deliver us from sin, not from bad ideas. He doesn't tussle our hair and say, oh, sport, You made a few foibles in your life. Our flesh is damning. Eternally damning. It damned the eternal son who took it upon himself. We have to get a grip of this because we live in a culture, we live in a desire today to to make sin small and man big. Woe to a world that makes light of the works of the flesh, but greater woe to a people of God and their ministers who redefine or are silent concerning the severity of sin in the works of the flesh. This foundational truth was evidently serious enough for the apostle to say, I'm telling you now, and I've told you before, and I likely think he would say, and I'll tell you again. The truth of eternal damning effects of the flesh warrants apostolic repetition. And if it warrants apostolic repetition, then surely it warrants pastoral reflection today. One who gives themselves over. That's the word he uses. He says one who practices or does. He's using the same word that John the apostle uses when he talks in 1 John about one who lives their life in, gives themselves over. One who gives themselves over to the work of the flesh is revealing they do not have the Spirit of God and thus they will not see the kingdom of God. I hope that scares everyone who hears it, including my own heart. Sin is devastating. Yes, true believers can and at times will fall into these godless vices. No, this doesn't mean that anyone who has ever committed one of these sins will go to hell, but it does mean that the one who practices, and that's the word intentionally used, as I said, the one who practices, lives in with unrepentant heart and life in these works of the flesh and the such like, the one who does these things, whether they've prayed that prayer at some point in their life or they were baptized or whatever they did, the one who practices these works will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not lose their place in the kingdom. They simply will not gain something they never truly possessed. For the works of the flesh when evident in one's life calls into serious question the reality of the presence of the Holy Spirit in that same life. Now, Paul is not saying that a believer won't do any of these works of the flesh because he's just said in the previous verse that the flesh is with us and it strives against the Spirit. That's why he uses that word practices. One who's doing these things. One who gives themselves over to the flesh is likely evidencing that they have no Holy Spirit at all. The works of the flesh are evident and our flesh inflames godless vices. But God's Spirit produces Christian virtue. That's the contrast here. In contrast to the works of the flesh which inflame this godless vice, the Holy Spirit of God produces true Christian verses, virtue. Look at it with me in verse 24. Look in your Bibles. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, nine here as opposed to 17 there. I don't think there's anything theological in those numbers. 
because he even says that the end of the fruit of the Spirit against such there is no law. So it's the same thing. This is not exhaustive either. There's more here. And Paul is not saying that a Christian will never do a work of the flesh and he's not saying an unbeliever can never do a work that looks like the Spirit. It's not truly the fruit of the Spirit, but they do things that are like the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Paul is saying that where the Holy Spirit resides, however, there will be an increasing moving away from the works of the flesh and an evident increase in produce from the Spirit. So he uses the term fruit here. And what a beautiful contrast between work of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit. If nothing else, it's an aesthetic, a pleasing contrast. It evokes in the mind, the, to me at least, and maybe it's because I have an overactive imagination at times, but it invokes in my mind the idea of the person with the sledgehammer and the rocks and they're working and they're working and they're working and it's dark and it's dim. And on the other hand, you have this idea of a tree and it's green and it's growing and it's refreshing and the refreshment on this side and the works on this side, the flesh on this side. And I think there's an intentional picture there, a description of beauty and dismay, destruction. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence of the Spirit's existence and indwelling presence. Grammatically, the word fruit is singular in the Greek language here, which is very interesting because it gives nine, but it uses a singular word, but the fruit singular of the Spirit. Now, people have written books on this, you know, like <laughs> trying to make sense of this because there is a plural in the Greek fruit. In our English language, the word fruit is both singular and plural, right? It's not the way it is in the Greek language. There is a clearly plural form, and he doesn't choose to use that one. He chooses to use the word singular. You know, Paul could have just been making a mistake, I suppose, grammatically, uh, but I don't believe that the Holy Spirit makes grammatical errors when he chooses certain words. So he uses this singular. So grammatically, it's singular. Possibly indicating that there is one chief fruit, a first fruit, you could say. Now, contextually, Paul has been emphasizing something, one of these fruits, right? He's been emphasizing contextually that one who loves his neighbor fulfills the whole law. And then theologically, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, Paul says that greatest of all Christian virtues is love. Jesus said that love is the foundation of the entire law. All the law and prophets is contained in this word. And so I think grammatically, contextually, and theologically, when he says the fruit of the Spirit, he's talking about the very first one he mentions. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And from love flows joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It's the first fruit. All these nine virtues are produced from the Holy Spirit, yes, but love is the first fruit. The principal manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It was the principal manifestation of the Son of God and it is the principal manifestation of the Holy Spirit and it should be the principal manifestation of the people of God. Love. Naturally, we skim this popular verse and immediately run to the application, as I said earlier, that we should be loving. But that's not the intent of the grammar of the text. It's still an indicative, a statement, not a command, because fruit is not generated by obedience, but it is the produce of a supernatural work of God's spirit through God's means of his word to create love among God's people. A good tree brings forth good fruit, and a bad tree brings forth bad fruit. Thus, the fruit of the Spirit is not something we try harder to produce, but something that the Spirit of God naturally, miraculously, even mysteriously produces in those who are regenerated by that same Spirit. Romans 5.5 5 says this. Now, hope, that's justification hope, assuring glorification. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out. Poured out love of God in our hearts 
How? How has the love of God been poured on us? Now in that text, he's not saying the love of God or God's love for us has been poured out, just that the love of God, God's love, the character of God in love has been poured out, graciously put upon us. How? He says, by the Holy Spirit who was given you. When you were regenerated, Christian, when you were born again, the Holy Spirit of God poured out the love of God upon you and in you. It is not that you simply felt God's love in the sense, it's a good sense, but that's not the sense here that you knew he loved you and died for you. It's not that you simply felt God's love in the sense that that it's amazing, wow, how could he love me? Well, that is true, and we can learn of God's love for us, what is being said in Romans 5, 5, and the idea that the fruit or the plain evidence of the Spirit is just simply love, is that when you received the Holy Spirit, which you did when God converted you, whether you felt it or not, you received, when you received the Holy Spirit, God immediately gave you participation in his divine nature of love. Peter says that we are partakers of the divine nature. In what way are we partakers of the divine nature? He doesn't say we will be in heaven. He says we are now. In what way are we partakers of the divine nature? We have the Holy Spirit of God who pours out the love that the Father and the Son shared for eternity. Eternal divine love. John 17 describes this eternal divine love. Not a love for us, but a love that God had for God. That this love that is eternal and divine and infinite, that this in the person of the Holy Spirit, because of the person of Jesus Christ, has been placed upon the believer. They have the love of God because God is love. You have an inner compulsion of divine love. Something actually changed when you were converted. Something actually happened when you were regenerated. And it's not something you did, it's something that was done to you. And you received, though you at that time perhaps knew nothing about it, you received like a light bursting upon your soul the love of God in a way that no one in the world, as well as they can love in different areas, but that no one without God, without Christ can ever comprehend. It's not about what you felt in that moment. It's what you possessed in that moment by faith. The Christian can love indeed. He is compelled to love, not only because he has been loved, which is true, but because the Christian has a supernaturally created heart of love given by regenerating grace. Furthermore, not only is this these these produce of the Spirit flowing down from the first fruit of love. Not only is that the case, but also in opposition to the works of the flesh, we see that they're principally selfless. Did you you notice that? The heart of love compels us to a deep-seated compulsion to joy. That's the word contentment. Peace or peaceful relationships. Suffering long, even with the unloving. Kindness towards sinner and saint alike. Goodness as a principle to live by, faithfulness to love and serve, gentleness and self-control and how we live in love. You see, the fruit of the Spirit, these produce here, have nothing to do with us. They're not selfishly motivated. They're selflessly motivated. Also, in contrast, you see how these produce foster true fellowship. They foster true fellowship. The, while the works of the flesh foster hatred, strife, murder, contention, party spirit, disunity, but love and its virtues foster greater koinonia, greater fellowship as we per, now pursue joy with one another, peace toward each other, suffering long with one another, kindness at one another, goodness for each other, faithfulness and commitment to fellowship with one another, gentleness in our care and even correction of one another. Fruit of the Spirit produces and fosters fellowship. Christian fellowship. But ultimately, and I think the greatest truth we glean is that when we place the vices of the flesh, the works of the flesh, next to the virtues of the Spirit, when you place them next to each other, the picture and character of Jesus Christ becomes manifestly evident as the fruit of His life. Have you ever considered that? Some have said that Galatians 5, 22 through 24 is simply a biography of Jesus. 
For wasn't the first fruit of Christ's life love? And didn't he, for the joy that was set before him, endure the cross so that he could make peace with sinners and God and even make peace with Jew and Gentile and tear down that wall of hostility? And didn't he suffer long so that we might be saved? And wasn't it the kindness, goodness, and faithfulness of Christ that led him not to condemn but to be condemned? And did he not with meekness, gentleness, extreme self-control give himself in our place who when he was reviled did not revile again and when he suffered he threatened not? Paul, by the way, actually makes this connection in the text. Did you notice the next verse, verse 24? He makes the connection. He says, and those who are Christ's. In other words, what he's saying there is, is the fruit of the Spirit is this, and if you have that, it's because you are Christ's. Because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. Because remember how Jesus Christ, before he left, what did he do with his disciples? He said, receive the Holy Spirit, and he gave them his Spirit. And if you are Christ's, And this brings our third indicative. The flesh inflames godless vice. The spirit produces Christian virtue. But Christ's death creates life in the spirit. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Again, this is not a command to crucify the flesh. I believe there are implications of that. But it is a statement of gracious reality. That in Christ, our flesh has been crucified and has no more authority over us. In Christ, we are enabled to live as spiritual beings, having received the Holy Spirit from Christ. The language is very similar to Romans chapter 6, the companion text of this Galatians passage. But there is a slight difference. In Romans 6, Paul speaks of the old nature being crucified with Christ, and nothing said of our action in that. Here in Galatians, Paul says that we have crucified the flesh, and there's not a difference of theology that Paul had, but actually a difference in perspective. While there is a passive perspective of the death of the old man in Christ, something done to us by Christ, there is at the same time an active perspective to the death of the flesh, something we do through Christ. And Paul is simply expressing this tension. But the principle remains the same. Law breaking, that's license, works of the flesh, will never produce the fruit of the Spirit. They're antonyms. And law keeping, that's legalism, will never generate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The law is powerless to do that. So whether my fleshly pursuit is goodness and religion or my fleshly pursuit is license and lust, it's still the fleshly pursuit. And flesh and spirit are at odds. Only by grace in union with the righteous obedience and vicarious sacrifice of Jesus Christ, will I be enabled to live in or live by the Spirit? Only in union to Christ does anyone live in the Spirit. And even in that sense, understand in the text before you, living in the Spirit is not a command either. He's saying it's true. If you have union with Christ... And hear this, beloved. If you have union with Christ, you live in the Spirit. You live by the Spirit because that's what I mean. The Spirit gives you life. If you have union with Christ, you also have new life because of the Spirit. You have life in the Spirit. And that's what he says before he gets to the imperative, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, he's summing up. Everything else he's already said. So this is life in the Spirit. Life in the Spirit is understanding that our flesh inflames godless vices and understanding that the fruit of the Spirit, that this produces Christian virtue. And it is only by being Christ that we live in the Spirit. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. By the washing and regenerating of the Word. It's not what I can do. 
It's what he has done. Only by Christ and his vicarious death and only by his active obedience can I even hope to have the Spirit of God who will produce these virtues in my life, which will then attack those vices. And so when he brings this one simple imperative up, if we live in the Spirit, here's the imperative, let us walk in the Spirit or keep in step with the Spirit. It's a third class condition. In other words, it's grammatically this way. Since we live in the Spirit, I mean, since the Spirit has given you life, walk. Keep in step with that spirit. This is, this is the indicative informing the imperative, right? This is what you have. And, and what a gracious thing it is that you have. You have life by God. You have life. Not just you have the prospect of eternal life. You have life now. He has given you a spiritual life and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And by grace alone, he made you alive in Christ. Only by grace you have been saved. Since you have life, then, and it's the Spirit that gives you life, then it's a simple imperative. So keep in step with the Spirit. So walk in that Spirit. How does this look in application? Well, we can actually go back now to the rest of the indicatives and recognize that they do have an imperatival, a command-like application. Put it this way. I'll just use one example here, and I'll leave you to fill in the blanks and to work on it yourself this week. But perhaps think of it this way. Since outbursts of wrath, that's what he says here, outbursts of wrath, since those are works of the flesh. And since peacefulness is a produce of the Spirit. And since you, by Christ, have life in the Spirit, then walk in step with peacefulness, not in step with outbursts of wrath. Do you you see how simple he's making? By the way, simplicity doesn't mean easiness. (laughs) But this is simple, right? Since this is of the Spirit and you have the Spirit, and you've been given life, walk in the Spirit. Do it this way. As I said, I'll leave you to fill out the blanks, because you could go through each one of these, and the such like, right? You can keep doing this, and see how simple Christ makes it. But, and in conclusion, there is a word of warning that Paul ends with that I think is very fitting for us to end with. It is expressed as the second imperative in our text. And it's not a command in addition to walk or keep in step with the Spirit. Rather, it's a warning concerning the root of the flesh opposed to the Spirit. In other words, it's a warning that says, and this will keep you from walking in step with the Spirit. This is the big wall that's going to be thrown up in front of you. Because one might say, as a, as a professing Christian, as a Christian, as a believer, they might say, okay, I don't like the works of the flesh. They look bad. <laughs> and I've experienced them, and they are bad. Uh, and that fruit of the Spirit, that's beautiful. And I want that. And I, and I have that. And, and I recognize in Christ, I, I have the Spirit of God, which will allow me to, kind of, to know and do these things, and I can walk in this. This is great. This is great news. But he gives this second imperative because there's a warning because what happens the minute you or I say, okay, by God's grace, I'm gonna walk in the Spirit. I'm gonna walk, keep in step with the Spirit. It's beautiful, it's good, let's do this. And he says, watch out for conceit. Watch out for conceit. Isn't it amazing that when we engage in good things, godly things, arrogance quickly raises its head. Doesn't this fit the context of Galatians? I could hear the legalists right now, the Judaizers, oh, Paul, you are so right. We agree with you. The works of the flesh, oh, bad stuff. We don't do that that much. Uh, But we do the spirit. We're fruitful people. And I can hear him saying, no, you're not. 
You're conceited. Arrogant. In fact, here's an interesting thing to think about this warning, how deep it goes. Because some translations use the word conceited. Others use the word arrogance. Some use the word a boasting. Let us not be boasting. But probably the most literal, though probably not as meaning as much in our language today as the old King James Version English of this, which is, uses the word uh, vainglory. Vainglory. Because the word is kenodoxos. Doxa is the word glory. Doxology, we get that from that word. Doxos, glory. Kenos is the word empty. Watch out for empty glory. What, what, makes, what, what is empty glory? It, it is conceit, it is arrogance, it is boasting. All those are appropriate words for it. It is, it is principally though what makes it so dangerous is that it is thievery on a divine level. God alone deserves honor and glory. All pursuits of human glory is vain glory. It is empty, it is useless, it is ridiculous, it is foolish, and it is a glory thievery. And he is saying, watch out for stealing the glory. Because that's what we like to do when we read passages like this, right? Well, I'm not that. I'm so glad I'm not like those other people that have all those works of the flesh problems. I'm so glad I'm fruit of the spirit like. Empty glory, vain glory, because if the one, anyone boasts, if anyone glories, let him glory in this. Let him glory in that he knows Christ. Let him glory in in the boast in the cross of Christ as his union with Christ is the only one and only thing that gives him anything by the Spirit. It is Christ alone that gives us a cause of glory and that glorying is not in ourselves at all. And so he says, let us not become conceited. Let us not engage in vain glory. Let us not pursue our own. Is it not true that according to the book of Ephesians that the purpose of why God has made grace such a beautiful thing is that no, so that no one should boast? <laughs> right? It's by grace that you are saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God lest anyone should boast. Glory is the word used there. Here's the reality. When we become conceited, when we are filled with our pride and our hubris and our glorying in ourselves, whether it's in our freedom or our law, whichever one we're glorying in, we have become glory thieves of the almighty Christ himself who is the only one who has given us anything good and righteous and holy. And that glory leads to what? That self-glory, that vainglory leads to what? Provocation. Envy, and he begins back to list the works of the flesh again. The works of the flesh all over again. Be warned, my friends, where pride is rooted, the works of the flesh will be manifest, and the fruit of the Spirit will be diminished. Pride is what drives nomianism, that's legalism, and pride is what drives antinomianism, the flesh. Three indicatives. Your flesh inflames godless vices. The Spirit produces Christian virtue and union with Christ alone by grace alone through faith faith alone creates life in the Spirit. Let these indicatives inform and motivate your imperative so walk in step with the Spirit of God through His his means, the Word of God. And do not let pride and vainglory deceive you and produce provocation and envy. We have life in the Spirit through the word of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, beloved of God, let us as God's people walk in step with that Spirit.